Greetings and salutations, everyone, to the virtual webinar, Slavery, uh, Slavery and Reparations, African Nova Scotia, Canada and Beyond, for the keynote lecture by the esteemed uh, Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. My name is Isaac Saini. I am the chair of the organizing committee for the 2023 University Studying Slavery Conference that will be hosted in Halifax in, in, in October of that year. We are organizing a series of virtual events in the run-up to 2023, not only to highlight slavery, reparations, and the attendant issues in Canada, and Nova Scotia, and beyond, but also to encourage as much participation as possible in this internationally central issue. I'd first like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. The territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, and we are all treaty people. We thank the elders and guardians of, of this land. Universities and organizers of this conference acknowledge the histories, contributions, and legacy of the African Nova Scotian people and communities who have been here for over 400 years. We thank them and pay tribute to their elders. We'd also think this is an appropriate time and necessary time to also acknowledge the African ancestors, those kidnapped and torn from Africa, those who died in the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean, those held in bondage and brutalized and lacerated in the plantations, those who lived under segregation, disenfranchisement, marginalization, oppression, and exploitation, who despite all of these injustices, repeatedly and relentlessly asserted their humanity by fighting to create a world of equality, equity, and justice. It is now my privilege to call to the floor uh, Dr. Frank Harvey, Vice President, Academic, and Prov Provost of Dalhousie University. Frank, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Isaac. It is such an honor for me to be part of this important pre-conference meeting in my role as Provost and Vice President Academic for Dalhousie University. And to offer a formal welcome on behalf of President Deep Saini and our entire Dalhousie community. We are thrilled to be co-sponsoring the university's Studying Slavery Conference scheduled for the fall of 2023 here in Halifax, and equally excited to be co-hosting the pre-conference launch today on the theme of slavery and reparations, Africa, Nova Scotia, Canada, and beyond, intended in part to help us further understand the central issues and how best to respond. Dalhousie recognizes the importance of reparations and he is committed to addressing the issue in the context of African Nova Scotians as a distinct people who have played an important role in the province's culture and history since 1605, as well as Caribbean Blacks, Black Canadians, and in general descendants of enslaved people of the African diaspora. This commitment includes the continued support to expanding research on the issue as we did with the Lord Dalhousie report and as we are now doing with support from a major grant from Canadian Heritage on Black People's History of Canada, led by Professor and Killam Chair, Dr. Rafool Cooper. And of course, as we plan to do uh, through the forthcoming University Studying Slavery Conference in partnership with the University of King's College and the Black Cultural Center of Nova Scotia. Our commitments to these principles and values are also reflected through our signing of the Scarborough Charter on anti-Black racism and Black inclusion in Canadian higher education, another important commitment tied to our civic university pillar and related principles now embedded in our new strategic plan. These commitments are also reflected in Dalhousie's history of responding to the needs uh, of the communities we serve uh, through groundbreaking initiatives that have created many opportunities for African Nova Scotia's and Nova Scotians and students, including the transition year program. Isaac Zaney, of course, is the, the director of the TYP program. The Indigenous Black and Mi'kmaq initiatives at the Shulik School of Law, our programs promoting leadership and health for African Nova Scotians, and of course, the Imhotep Legacy Academy, an innovative university community partnership that uniquely mobilizes university and college students, faculty, and community leaders to help improve student success and bridge the achievement gap for grades six to 12 students of African heritage in Nova Scotia. Our commitments to the principles and themes of the conference are also reflected in scholarship support for African Nova Scotians and other students of African descent, including the recently implemented Sankofa scholarships, doubling our enrollment 
of black students with, a much, uh, with much more work to be done, of course, particularly in relation to the promotion of African Nova Scotians in our student population, tuition fee waiver, waivers for African Nova Scotian students, waivers of international differential fees for self-identified black Caribbean students, targeted hiring initiatives, a new equity admissions policy, and of course, the work towards establishing Dalhousie's Black Studies Research Institute. And finally, our African Nova Scotia strategy, which includes recommendations for pathway programs, student bursaries and scholarship support and enhanced curriculum and research opportunities. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Douglas Ruck, chair of the Board of Governors at the University of King's College. Doug is a graduate of both University of King's College and Dalhousie Law School. Uh, and he has a distinguished record of community engagement and leadership, sharing time and expertise with a range of volunteer organizations, including the Black Cultural Center of Nova Scotia, East Preston Daycare, Rotary Club of Halifax, Change Canada Foundation, and the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, and the Nova Scotia Law Foundation. Thank you very much, Doug, for your service. I'll now pass it over to you for your welcome and your introductions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. It's in my honor as uh, chair of the Board of Governors of the University of King's College uh, to have this opportunity to be part of this event. And I must start off by saying how thrilled uh, University of King's College is to welcome Sir Hilary Beckles to Halifax, albeit virtually. Uh, King has begun making reparations for its responsibility for slavery in and beyond Nova Scotia. Uh, we at University are grateful for the opportunity for this lecture and the discussion that will follow uh, the panel that preceded it enables us to more deeply understand our responsibilities and our opportunity to address the legacy of intergenerational harms we as a university have contributed to. King has looked deeply into the history of its connections to the enslavement of black people and how it has benefited from those connections. Our just completed uh, scholarly inquiry on King's and slavery confirms what many knew had to be true that for decades from its founding, founding in 1789, substantial percentages of the government funding that made the university viable came from, the, from provincial and British taxes on goods produced by enslaved people in the Caribbean. Over a longer period of time, additional subsidies, tuition of many students, and significant donations uh, depended upon wealth based on the enslavement of Black people in Nova Scotia and beyond, particularly in the Caribbean. Kings and people connected to Kings were deeply impl implicated in the support of Nova Scotians for slavery's continuation up to and beyond its abolition in 1834. This means our university, my university, the oldest in Nova Scotia by three decades, has a particular obligation to those who have experienced multi-generational harm as, as African Nova Scotians due to the central role it has played in the implanting anti-Black racism into the fa fabric of Nova Scotia, where it has excluded African Nova Scotians from equitable access to higher education for centuries. Kings therefore acknowledges and accepts the responsibility and opportunity we have to make reparations in various forms and to contribute to the wider embrace of reparative justice as an obligation of society, including by making Kings holistically accessible to Black students and into a university where Black students cannot only attend, but flourish. We have started by reinstating and creating new scholarship for Black students, by hiring Black individuals, and by removing the name of one of our most famous graduates who propagated anti-Black racism from the most recent four rooms that have all been named in his honor. Kings realizes that we have only just begun and that further progress must be made in partnership with the African Nova Scotian community and with black members of our community, of my community. Kings looks forward to moving from the informal dialogue we have had with the community members to a more formally organized engagement that allows us to follow the core principle, nothing about us with us, as we move forward. Welcome, Dr. Beckles. Delighted that you're here, sir. And it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Russell Gross, who will introduce uh, Dr. Beckles. Russell is the Executive Director of the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia. And under Russell's leadership, the center has moved from being 
uh, a prominent uh, entity in the province of Nova Scotia to a national entity and is now making great inroads as an international uh, institution. Russell, please, thank you. Thank you, Doug, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, so glad to be a part of this uh, important uh, planning committee that uh, brought uh, this subject together, the subject of slavery and reparations to have an open discussion and looking forward to the progression of this discussion uh, towards the conference in 2023. This evening, I have a wonderful task uh, to introduce our guest lecturer, and I'm honored and privileged to introduce Sir Hilary Buckles. A distinguished academic, Sir Hilary Beckles is a global public activist in the field of social justice and minority empowerment who has achieved recognition internationally for his contributions and leadership expertise. He has lectured extensively in Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia, and has published over 100 peer-reviewed essays and scholarly journals and over 13 books on subjects ranging from Atlantic and Caribbean history, gender relations in the Caribbean, sport development, and popular culture. In 2007, he was awarded Barbados highest national honor when he was made a Knight of St. Andrews for his contributions to higher education, the arts, and sports. He has received numerous honorary doctorates from around the world, and in 2021, he received the Martin Luther King Jr. Global Award for Peace and Freedom. Sir Hillary is a chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, advisor on sustainable development to former United Nations Secretary General Ben Kamoun, president of Universities Caribbean and chairman of the Caribbean Examinations Council. It's my honor and distinct privilege to present to our virtual space, space this evening, Sir Hilary Beckles. Well, thank you so very much, uh, uh, Russell, for your very generous and kind uh, introduction. And I, I wish to recognize and to, and to thank most profoundly uh, my host, my colleagues at uh, Dalhousie University, as well as the University of of King's College. I thank you all very kindly uh, for reaching out and for imagining that I could make a contribution uh, to your conference as you progress towards 2023. I, I thank you uh, for, your, for your generosity. I also wish to recognize uh, Theresa, uh, who has been absolutely magnificent in her conversations, her, her kindness, her, her belief, I could uh, add some value to this broad project of, of Dalhousie University of Kings, and also to her own program in, in equity, uh, inclusion, and, and, and justice. Theresa, I thank you so very much, as I also recognize uh, my old friend who is a part of this, uh, this audience, uh, Sakaya. Uh, Thomas. But, but why, why am I here and why, why are we all here? We are here because we, we recognize that in addition to the impact of technological innovation upon the contemporary world, that there is a growing shift in popular culture around the issues of social justice. Uh, we, are, we are seeing this all over the world. We are, we are recognizing this in our institutions and in our political relationships and our economic systems. We are recognizing that something fundamental is changing within modernity as we have lived it. And of course, we recognize that in all of, the, all of those post-colonial and the new democracies of the world, those democracies that have emerged out of the rubble and the ashes of dying colonialism, including the Caribbean and Africa and Latin America, Asia, that these new democracies are given tremendous impetus to a sense of equality, of justice, diversity, and also within the old democracy, there is an unraveling of the, tra of the traditional institutions and relationships 
that constituted modernity. This unraveling is very profound, and I believe that this is the, the central characteristic of the contemporary world. We, we are seeing this unraveling in, in, in public governance, relations of race and class and gender, but systems of power are being interrogated and, and, re, and rejected. You know, uh, in 2001, I had the pleasure of, uh, of leading and coordinating Caribbean perspectives at the Durban Conference, the, the United Nations Conference on Race and Xenophobia, Racism, and to meet people from all over the world who had gathered both at the level of civil society and, and the state to talk about the deep injustices in the current world and especially those with historical roots. And uh, that was a magnificent moment for me because I found myself uh, speaking alphabetically and, and, and speaking between, uh, between um, Fidel Castro and Arafat. And that was, that was really a, an extraordinary moment. And, and to comment upon ideas of race, white supremacy, North Atlantic culture, post-colonial developments, post-apartheid developments, and this search for justice that has enveloped the entire world. So really, we all started to, to unpack the concept of modernity, uh, to dissect its structures and its relationships, and to speak about those early formations, the genocide against indigenous peoples across the world, we can speak specifically about our own circumstances here in the Americas, uh, from, from Nova Scotia all the way to Chile through the Caribbean. We can speak of what happened to our indigenous people. I am particularly sensitive to this because I'm from the island of Barbados in the Caribbean and Barbados entered this genocidal phase of its history in a very loud and impactful way. When the British arrived in Barbados in 1625 to establish a colony, the colonizing party wrote a letter back to the King of England, uh, indicated that we have arrived at this island called the Barbados. And uh, guess what, uh, your majesty? There are no people on the island. We have surveyed the entire island and there are no people but there are houses everywhere. And it was that relationship between an empty island that is populated with empty houses that brings the issue of, of genocide closer to home because the Portuguese had been raiding the island to take away the native people uh, into Brazil to work on the sugar plantations. And the Spanish had been raiding the island uh, to take the natives off to work in the mines of Mexico. And thus the island was empty, empty houses everywhere. That is, uh, that is uh, the shadow of genocide that projects across, this, across this, this hemisphere. And of course, it is replaced by something called chattel slavery. Not just slavery, but chattel slavery. The concept that African peoples were defined in law and treated in economics and sociology as property, non-human, chattel, and real estate. That was an historic moment that has shaped the hemisphere because Barbados became not only the symbol of genocide, but it now becomes, it now becomes a metaphor for chattel slavery everywhere across, across the hemisphere. And with it, of course, comes the white supremacy structure, comes the notion that uh, we are developing a new kind of economic force, a uh, new kind of economic culture. And this economic culture was going to shape the modern world uh, forever. And this was the perception of those who consider themselves the architects of it, that we have finally found a system of economic accumulation or wealth extraction using a type of labor, and that this was going to generate unprecedented levels of wealth 
and it was going to empower the white race in a way it had never been empowered before. And this was going to be the future. And the future they imagined was not going to be just two or 300 years. They imagine a future that can best be defined as forever. Thus, this is the context within which we are operating, in which we are living, in which we are living today. The nation states of Europe created this structure, maximized the expansion, gave themselves a global military and economic advantage over humanity, and this was the outcome, this was the mechanism, this is the, the consequences. Their colonies have become nation states. So Canada has become a nation state. The colony transition from that status into what we know today, bring in with it, bring in with it aggressively into the present and into the future. All of those institutional systems and relationships upon which it was built, defining them, defending them, and allowing their legacy to shape the now. And that legacy has shaped the now. And all of us are engaged in that conversation. We are engaged in that conversation from the point of view of being public intellectuals, but critically, we are also institutional leaders shaping and defining the role and functions of the university. And this is what I especially wish to speak about, the role of the university, the role of public intellectuals, the role of institutional academics, and their partnering with colonial elites and coming forward into the present time, they're partnering with new and emerging states in order to establish the culture of injustice and inequity that we are seeking to litigate and to adjust today in order to create a better future for humanity. So what have we inherited as academics, as intellectuals, as scholars? The first point to recognize is that when all of this was being developed in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, there was always a culture of resistance. There was always a culture of resistance by universities, by public ad academics, by well-known writers and scholars, persons in civil society. But how easily their resistance was brushed away. How easily the juggernaut of state sanctioned power, the culture of extraction and the denigration of humanity in the process, how easily opposition to all of that was set aside. But importantly, when, when the critics were brushed aside and those who res resisted were set aside, another cadre of scholars emerged to validate and, and to empower the system. And let us look at what the universities provided. The university provided the legal concepts and the legal principles that enabled the slave courts to function as legitimate tools of economic governance. Yes, the universities provided the theories and the concepts that yes, you can convert people into a unit of property, that you can deny their humanity, that you have arguments to ignore and set aside their claims to be human beings to enable them to function. The universities provided the political arguments to say that such people, such enslaved and captured and subjugated people should have no human rights or political rights to participate in any, in any system of governance. The universities provided a sociology to define these people as, as culturally inferior, physically uh, inferior, and in any way, and always not suited to live within a community dominated by white people, even though the concept of whiteness was created by black people. The universities provided the theology that justified the enslavement and the genocide. All of the ideas that enable white supremacy to function, all of the ideas that enable slavery 
to be an effective market operational system and a system of governance. The philosophies, the ideas, the values from economics all the way to theology came out of the university system. The universities were the principal participation, participants in the crime against humanity we associate with genocide and chapter slavery. The university system, the university community was sitting on the front bench of all of these crimes that were committed. And we should not be surprised by this because when we, when we move forward into the 20th century manifestation of this vision that found itself in Nazi Germany, again, we found the university sitting on the front row of the Nazi crimes against the Jewish communities and other people. So what is there about the university that enable is, enable it to participate in such, a, in such an atrocious engagement with what we are describing today? Well, those who were brushed aside were brushed aside by the concept of the national interest. The state, its corporate officials, its elite classes defined the appropriation of the land and the labor of the native people as international interest. They also defined chattel slavery as being in the national interest. And therefore to oppose slavery, to oppose the colonization and the subjugation of indigenous people would be to oppose the national interest and to oppose the national interest in an age when nationalism is the most, the most powerful ideological force. Where the nations of Europe are, are involved in this political competition to assert supremacy over each other and to assert the rise of their nation over other nations and needing these vehicles in order to generate the wealth, to translate that wealth into military might. And so to oppose was to oppose the nation and national interest. And once that resistance was broken, then the system continued until it was no longer needed. A great deal, for example, has been said about Adam Smith, the great economist of Britain mid 18th century who developed the argument that the time had come to dismantle this horrific economic system of wealth accumulation and that Western civilization could do without it. Yes, he did make the argument that after 200 years, we had extracted enough wealth out of enslavement and native subjugation. And we don't need it no more. The time has come to transition to a higher level, something called the liberal market. But the time had come. Why wasn't there an Adam Smith 100 years earlier? because there was no argument that could counter the power of capitalism and slavery. But Adam Smith made the argument at precisely the right time, which says it has served its purpose, time to dismantle. Time to dismantle and move to a higher level. And this is what we are speaking about today, the transformation of this system, the evolution of those early systems into 19th century models, what they call the post-slavery models of plunder, Jim Crow, apartheid, all of these post-slavery models that were developed to sustain the issue of racial subjugation. All of this we are dealing with today in our universities, the legacies, the complicity of our universities the role and function of our public intellectuals and professors. And we are, our libraries are filled with the literary output of the pro-slavery academia of the contemporary period. Thus, we are now looking at the contradictions of race. And where better to begin than to look at John Locke who in the middle of the 17th century was arguably the most respected philosopher in Western Europe. But uh, when he wrote his, his, three, his treaties and theories on, on justice and liberty, and he was asked the question, how can, you, how can you square this issue? 
your intellectual reputation is that you are the leading academic thinker on the concept of liberty and freedom, but you are a slave owner in the Caribbean. And you are the secretary of the Royal African Company that had a mandate to take 4,000 Africans to the Caribbean sugar plantations per year. How do you do this? Well, he made it very clear. He said, my theories of liberty and freedom do not apply to black people. I'm speaking about Western civilization and the people who have built it. The Africans at best are a subspecies. So therefore I am not subject to that kind of racial conversation because they are not a part of my intellectual framework. But that is how we proceeded. And it was precisely that language that led to the notion of democracy being a white structure and concept. It's precisely that argument that led to the notion that black people who were fighting for freedom every day on the plantations, fighting on the slave ships, fighting to get freedom for their families, for their communities, and to build independent communities of justice, that these people who were fighting to overthrow slavery every single day were not building a democracy movement. They were not building a democracy movement. The slave owners were building the democracy movement, but the enslaved who were fighting for freedom and justice were not building the democracy movement. Thus, we have this academic literature that speaks to the, the founding fathers and mothers of democracy, and it does not begin with those people who every day of their lives were strategizing to find ways to bring freedom to humanity and to, up, and to uproot institutions and legacies of downtrodden of people creating that spirit of justice. These people are removed from the literature and by extension, removed from the academy. Removed from the academy in their lives. This is something that presses home powerfully when we walk through the doors of academia, corrupted by the powers of slavery and those who wish to accumulate wealth from slavery, corrupted by it. And thus, we are looking at a process of continuity from colony to nation state through to the oppressiveness of a now. That's the argument, oh, well, you know, slavery, colonization, these things were a long time ago. Why should I be held responsible for the behavior of my ancestors? Why should I be bound uh, by a morality of the 21st century when in fact these crimes were committed in the 17th, 18th centuries? Why should we transport a value system over 200 years into the now to engage us in a moral conversation. That is what the argument has been. I have been hearing that argument all over the world for the last 30 years. It is just the fluttering of a discredited philosophy. It is so easy to establish in academia that the wealth of yesterday passes on to today that the relationships of yesterday shape today, that everything that we know and live and feel and experience, the core principles of what we go through every day that shape our lives were brought to us live and direct from the past into the now. And we're not speaking about the distant past, we are speaking about history within our lifetimes. I was raised in a household by my great grandmother. She was 100, just 99 years old when she passed. I was a child. Remember her fondly, but she always spoke about her parents and grandparents, enslaved people. I was born on the same plantation. I was born on the same plantation as my great, my grandmother and my great grandmother whose parents and grandparents and great grandparents were slaves and who they spoke about. And the fact that I emerged as an academic from that plantation has a great deal to do with the stories which they told about what their parents' life was all about. 
And critically, when I was a child on that plantation, the owners of that plantation were the same people who had enslaved my great grandparents. It is the continuity of ownership. Everywhere you look, structures of ownership, of race relations, of power, of gender, of class, in the contemporary. Yes, there have been some changes, but you can never feel the power of change when the fundamental principles remain. So you're a black man, you're a black woman, you're a black girl, you're a black child, you walk through Nova Scotia, you're living every day, in this community in Canada, you are part of that world, but you can feel the power of history all around you. You can feel it in your household when you sit down to have dinner, when you speak with your friends, when you go to college, you can feel that history pressing down on your day-to-day -day existence because it was just yesterday. It was just yesterday. And this is why I made the argument 20 years ago at Durban in my plenary address that the reparations movement is going to be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. At the time that argument was made, some people thought it was hyperbolic. Some people thought, yes, that Professor Beckles has gone into the, an extreme view of the future. But I have lived to see in the last 20 years, year by year, the truth of that argument because it was clear. There was no visionary insight. It was clear that 80% of the world was rising up against the injustices that they have inherited from the last century or two. That the relationships in the institutions the relationships in education, in the workplace, and political governance, that all around the planet, the toxic force of racial hatred that had defined modernity was no longer acceptable as a way of social living today. That we're not going to accept it. Not that our foreparents had not resisted it because they did every day of their lives. But the military might of that white supremacy complex, no doubt, impacted upon the survival and the sustainability of those value systems. But the whole world is now awakened to this. And in our space, in our universities, something much more profound has evolved. And it is this. No university can claim to be excellent if it is not ethical. And all of those universities that have built their financial sustainability and their infrastructures on the wealth from the slavery world are now faced with an ethical problem. It is not acceptable to say that my academic research the quality of my professors, the outputs from my research institutes, the quality of our students and when they graduate, how excellent they are. You cannot package that into a concept of excellence if at the same time you ignore, marginalize or suppress the unethical conduct of your institution to arrive at the stage where it has arrived cannot be excellent if you're not ethical. And you cannot be ethical if you know that your pedagogy has been a critical force in creating and sustaining crimes against humanity. You cannot be ethical if you accept and embrace that the proceeds of crimes against humanity that enable your institution to thrive if you believe that you can ignore all of that into the future because you are producing first-class graduates and your professors are excellent. 
there is an immorality that has taken root in the Western Academy that we are now trying to address. And there are several ways to address this. I, of course, like many other scholars, have looked very carefully at the, the, the reports of Dalhousie, the history on race and slavery, and that fascinating report that I uh, appeared in uh, 2019. But while I, while I accept the academic integrity of that magnificent piece of research, I am not altogether satisfied that we have reconstructed the house of Dalhousie. I am not sure that we have done enough with the house of Dalhousie. And I'm speaking from a Caribbean perspective because it is through the Caribbean that Lord Dalhousie entered, participated in the military complex of the slave plantation, learning all of that reality and arriving in Canada as the new representative of the Caribbean slave complex, which he brought into Nova Scotia, the house of Dalhousie. And what does that mean for the university? What does that mean for the universities? Well, I have been a participant in a number of conversations in a number of universities, most recently the relationship with the University of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Well, Glasgow's own research shows that here is one of the oldest universities in Western Europe. I believe it's the fourth oldest university uh, in Great Britain, but it drank deeply from the well of slavery. Drank very deeply from the well of slavery, the endowments, the infrastructural investments, the embrace of the academy, and the academy itself becoming a leading voice in defending slavery, sustaining slavery, defending colonization, sustaining it. So, yes, it sold its soul. It sold its soul for the, the cash of slavery. And it was not the only one. The vast majority of the Western universities saw a revenue stream that they could not resist. And not only did they see a revenue stream that they could not resist, they were part of a civilization that had bought into the notion that indigenous peoples must be pushed aside to enable their culture to flourish, and that African peoples were part of a subspecies who were to work for them for free. And so black people, millions of them were brought into the Americas to work for free for the universities, for the trustees, for the governors, for the merchant class and for the aristocracy and for the royal family. The entire architecture was built on the notion that black people ought to work for free for centuries. In fact, for the foreseeable future, the universities were there. And now we have a response to the notion that no university can be excellent unless it's ethical we have a response where many universities are now researching their relationship to slavery, not only at the level of ownership, not only at the level of endowments and cash and revenue, but also their intellectual participation with their pedagogy, the pedagogy of slavery, all of that. But many of them are now researching and running, hence the concept of research and run across the Western world. Most universities forced to research their legacy on receiving the data are running away. Those that are not burying their heads in the sand are running away. 
the research is put into the archives and it's interest for researchers to go and have a look at it. Then there is also the response which says, all we need to do is to acknowledge the research. Mm -hmm. And if we do move to implement, we implement something that is marginal, something that is minimal, something that would allow us to clear our conscience and move on. But you cannot clear your conscience as a self-ascription. You clear your conscience when those on the outside agree that your conscience can now be cleared. You don't clear your conscience by saying, I've done X and Y, and therefore my conscience is clear. That is not acceptable. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't make the issue go away. I have tried to persuade many universities having taken this information about your past. These are the kinds of projects that you can participate in that will suggest a, a level of repair and repartory justice that has integrity, that will lay the foundation for the future, that could sustain your institution at a higher level, that you can move to a higher level of repair and to strengthen your institution for, for this 21st century. But it requires courage. It requires courage at the level of university leadership. It requires courage. It requires courage, commitment, and clarity of thinking. It's not an easy matter. It's a very simple matter to seek to discredit reparationist arguments. But time is on the side of the reparationists because they are seeking to move us all to a higher level of civilization where humanity can be at its finest so that we can uproot this toxic force called racism from our civilization to allow the human family to function in the way it was meant to function. I am the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and it is from this perspective that I speak. It wasn't very long ago that we were building a medical faculty on our campus at the, the, Mona, the Mona campus in Kingston. It wasn't very long ago. And the, the bulldozers came, the tractors came to dig up the earth to lay the foundation for the state of the art medical faculty. And as the dirt came up, what came up with it was hundreds and hundreds of bones. Yes, because my university was built on a slave plantation. And where the medical faculty was going to emerge was the unmarked graves of hundreds of enslaved Africans who lived on the plantation. When they died, they were just thrown into a hole, a shallow grave. And through the process of history, no one knew that this was a shallow grave for hundreds of enslaved Africans. And here we are, university leaders with responsibility for the education of the descendants of these very enslaved people and their bones are coming up from the ground speaking to us. How about us? And then we are going to hear from somewhere in the Western world, oh, you know, slavery was a long time ago. We cannot, we cannot recalibrate. But here on my campus, on my university campus, somewhere between the medical faculty and the faculty of social sciences, the bones were coming up from the ground with all of the, all of the, the, the hatred and the evil of the disposal of property. Not humans, not Africans with names and cultures and values, just property thrown to the ground. And thus, this University of the West Indies has a responsibility that is very profound and very deep to speak to this history because it is alive for us today. And I'm sure it is as alive for all of my colleagues, all of you who are in Nova Scotia and Dalhousie, it is alive for you and for all of us. 
University of London, classically, I was a member of that research project. Let us study everything we can about the economics of emancipation and produce some magnificent work. But having researched the Iran, having researched the Iran. Now, how about the medical schools? How about all of these brilliant, distinguished medical schools in the Western Academy? We know who they are. The slave ships were required to have medical interns. The slave ships were used as laboratories for medical interns. The plantations were used as post-graduation experimentation for young doctors. We have the records of those young doctors who accompanied the slave ships all across the Atlantic and who offered a diagnosis to the captains of slave ships. This one is sweating and has a fever. We suspect it's malaria, throw that person overboard. And now we have the data to show, no, 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 no. Those were the symptoms of dehydration and stress. And these were perfectly healthy people who given proper water and food would have survived that eight weeks passage across the Atlantic, but no, they were misdiagnosed by these medical students and young doctors who now carry the responsibility for the fact that 20% of the Africans were thrown into the water because it was assumed that they had diseases that were going to be contagious. That history is, is now there waiting to be properly researched and those universities that were placing their medical interns on those their ships out of the ports have a duty to research that history and to present the truth. So, this is nothing that we could say can be treated in a minimalist way. You research, you give a scholarship. I was at the University of Bristol uh, a year and a half ago speaking about these matters. Oh, the university said, well, you know, here's Bristol, Britain's richest, one of Britain's richest slave ports, a university that was built by the legacies of the families who made their money from slavery and who gave endowments to the university, built their magnificent structures and so on. But they want to give a scholarship or two. They want to hire one professor who's a professor of black history. So they put together a few very interesting little packages and that will atone for 300 years of extraction from black people. That will tone. It is, it, is, it is so disgraceful, the notion of the minimalist response to a crisis of humanity that is calling for a proportionate response so we can have a level playing field so that we can go on. The universities in the Western world are going to be crying out for a vision, a strategy that will allow them to revalidate and to emerge as excellent and ethical. We are all at the same crossroads and we have to make the right choices because we know where we want to go. We know where we want to be. And because we love academia and we take ownership for the institutions of academia, the universities and colleges of the world, this is our sector that we love and care for and we want it to prosper. We want it to be morally forceful. We want it to be in the vanguard of humanity at its best. So we take custodial responsibility for it. This is a conversation in which I'm just sharing with you how I feel about what you are doing at Dalhousie and Kings, what we are doing in the Caribbean, and what we are speaking about all over the world. So I celebrate I celebrate your efforts. I am honored to be a part of this, of this conversation. We know we have to decolonize the curriculum. We know we have to connect to the communities around us. We know we need to have access and we know we need atonement. There is a need for a new consensus. That consensus about the role of the university with integrity. It has to be a new discourse. Dalhousie and Kings are well positioned. 
I have just participated with one of your sister universities over at Brock. And we have established a joint institution to deal with some of these matters. So now we have the Brock University of the West Indies, the Canada Caribbean Institute. And we built the Canada Caribbean Institute because we know the history of the relationship between Canada, Caribbean slavery, not only with General Brock after the American War and how they built the university in his honor, but we know also Nova Scotia and the role it played, the Jamaicans who were morose, the democratic struggle, all of those enslaved Africans who were brought to Nova Scotia and who were part of the rise of democracy from the grassroots and what happened to them being sent over uh, to Sierra Leone and all of that history. Of course, we know all of that, but we have to make that right. Because this is our 21st century and we are imagining this century without the toxic force of slavery. We in academia must undo that which we did. We have a duty to civil society and this time we have to win. We cannot be brushed aside now by those powers of, of reaction and, and those defenders of the legacy. This time we must not be brushed aside. This time, our morality, our sense of justice and fairness, our sense of humanity's protectors as scholars, this time we must not be brushed aside. We have to say, no, we are taking a stake in the ground to protect the diversity of humanity and to push humanity to its highest level of sophisticated performance. That's what we want, humanity, performing with the sophistication of culture. There are those who have argued that we have finally found an argument to brush aside the reparationists. Oh, let us promote climate change. Because if climate change becomes the biggest 21st century argument, then it pushes reparations into second position. We have found a discourse to finally discard reparations. But what has happened it became quite clear that the climate change discourse and the reparations discourse are the two sides of the same coin because those people who are living in those places with the legacy of slavery and colonization and oppression are on the vanguard, the frontier of climate change. Again, the Caribbean. They are projecting the disappearance of many of our islands and therefore these islands that were in the vanguard of slavery and genocide are now in the vanguard of climate change as well. The power of continuity. And so we have now said that the climate change and the reparatory justice discourses are the integrated discourses of the 21st century. They're not separate and apart, they are integrated. We are here in the reparations movement to defend the future, to defend the integrity of our institutions, the philosophies of justice, of fairness, all of the values that we hold most dear, we are prepared to struggle for them within the framework of academia and civil society and beyond. This is, this is the message I would wish to leave with you, my colleagues that there is no carpet in the world that is large enough to brush the legacies of these crimes under. There's no carpet. There's only discourse. There's only conversation and commitment to change, not superficial symbolic change, but systemic change that has integrity. That is what we are pushing for, to undo the things that our institutions did at an earlier time. I thank you for the generosity of your patience. Thank you very much. Many thanks uh, for this uh, powerful and impactful uh, lecture. Uh, we are so pleased and honored and blessed uh, to hear your perspectives and uh, to, to uh, 
you know, look at the, the aspects of what you've talked about as a call to action uh, to our universities and as us as a people moving forward. On behalf of uh, the planning committee, which is made up of Dalhousie University, University of King's College and the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia, we want to thank you uh, so tremendously for your time this evening and your ability to, uh, to share with us. And uh, at this time, uh, I wanna to mention to those that are, that are on this virtually, that uh, the Q&A function that's on um, the, the Zoom system here, uh, feel free to put your questions in as we go to a stage in the next part of our program, which I'm gonna welcome our discussant for the evening. And that's none other than uh, our local friend and uh, colleague, Dr. Afua Cooper. Afua Cooper, PhD, has been at the forefront of mobilizing multidisciplinary knowledge about Black Canadian studies. She is the country's leading expert on slavery and freedom and is trained in Black Canadian history, the history of African, of the history of the African diaspora and decolonization studies. A professor of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science at Dalhousie University. She is the director of the Black People's History of Canada Project and holds a Killam Research Chair. Her book, The Hanging of Angelique, The Untold Story of Slavery in Canada and the Burning of Old Montreal broke new grounds in slavery studies and the history of Black Canada. Dr. Cooper was a coordinator and chief knowledge officer of the Ontario Bicentenary to Abolish the Slave Trade Act, in which she oversaw 33 projects that pertain to slavery and the freedom in Canada. Dr. Cooper has curated and co-curated eight exhibits on slavery in Canada and the African diaspora. She chaired the scholarly panel that investigated Dalhousie University's relationship to race, slavery, and anti-Blackness, and was the lead author of the subsequent document report on Lord Dalhousie's history on slavery and race. Dr. Cooper was recently appointed as the Canadian UNESCO representative for the United Nations Slave Root Project. She's held the James R. Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies and also founded the Black Canadian Studies Association and served as its chair for over 10 years. A celebrated poet, Dr. Cooper is one of the founders of the Canadian Dub Poetry Movement and has published six books of poetry, including the award-winning Black Matters. She is a recipient of the Portia White Prize, Nova Scotia's highest artistic recognition. I give you Dr. Ofua Cooper. Thank you, Russell, so much for such a generous introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. And Dr. Beckles, I want to thank you for such an insightful, brilliant, moving and riveting pre presentation. I um, thank you for your courage and for your vision. I was deeply moved by your talk. I am deeply involved in this issue. As Russell pointed out, I chaired the panel that investigated Dalhousie's relationship to race, slavery, and anti-Blackness. I was a lead author of the report, that the subsequent report along with, with other colleagues. I, I'm involved in the university studying slavery. I'm a member of this organizing panel for this conference. And so this is something that I, I grapple with every day, every night in my sleep, I think about it. And, um, when, when Dalhousie University and King's College embarked on this uh, process, on the project, the research project, this investigation to look at our institution's history with slavery and race. And um, we, we had extensive discussions before we actually went in and started uh, doing the research. And we discovered um, five distinct areas, I call it five entanglements, and which it can go across, uh, it's pertinent for both, these five areas are pertinent for both Dalhousie and King's University. The first one, Dr. Beckles, as you mentioned, you talked about um, Lord Dalhousie bringing this Caribbean infrastructure, or this ideological, um, these ideas to Nova Scotia because Dr. Uh, I mean, Lord Alhousie as a young man 
um, was involved in the Franco, Anglo-Franco Wars, the Revolutionary Wars, and he actually led the invading force, the British invading force on the island of Martinique. The, the, the French commissioners from the, the, the Republic had abolished slavery in the French West Indies. And, um, and, and Dalhousie and his, his colleagues, they went and they reinstituted slavery. So that was, that was 1794. In 1816, he arrives in Nova Scotia as governor. The, the Napoleonic Wars have ended. He got a really nice job to become governor. And, and he arrives here and uh, met up with the black refugees of the War of 1812. These people who had fought for the British during the War of 1812 and were promised land and support. And uh, 3,000 were transported to Nova Scotia. And his idea was that Nova Scotia should be a white man's country. And he wanted to deport the black refugees, in fact, send them back to slavery in the United States. So in terms of, so that was one of the, the entanglements we discovered. Another entanglement was the whole issue of the Castine Fund and the taxes that Nova Scotia and other maritime provinces leveled or levied on slave grown goods that came from the West Indies. And so the Castine Fund, and, and our audience should know this, was the, um, a fund, a pot of money that the Canadians and the British seized during the War of 1812, when they went down to Castine, Maine, and, and took the money at the port. We know um, our investigations reveal to us that fully one third of the Castine money came from the Caribbean slave trade, came from taxes on the sugar, the rum and molasses that was grown by uh, enslaved people. But Dalhousie University, when the money came back to Halifax, this was the money that was given to Lord Dalhousie and which he used to establish Dalhousie University. So Dalhousie University was established from the, 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 the wealth of the slave trade. A similar thing with King's College. Um, so many of the people, the officials at King's College um, who, who owned slaves, in here in Nova Scotia, but they also gained their fortunes from the West India trade. So the West India trade is all over Halifax. It's all over Kings and Dal. It's all over Nova Scotia. It's all over the maritime provinces. It's all over the so-called lower colonies of, of what became known as Quebec and, and Ontario because the sugar trade went everywhere. We also know that early Dalhousie leaders, people like the, the first faculty, the head of the faculty of the medical school, William Johnston Allman, was a supporter of the American Confederacy. He believed that Black people were naturally inferior and they should not be, gain their freedom. Lincoln should not abolish slavery. So um, Allman raised lots of money and sent it down south to the Confederate, um, he, he, he uh, got a purse for Jefferson Davis, that sort of thing. And his son, who was also a medic, went down south to work for the Confederates during the Civil War. And in fact, Dr. Allman and son both trained at Glasgow and Edinburgh. So those are some of the issues that we, we grapple with today at Dalhousie University. I mean, the West India trade is written, it's on campus. It's, it's hidden in plain view because the official residence of Dalhousie's um, president, um, that beautiful house there on um, Oxford Street, uh, was owned by a West India merchant, merchant by the name of Levy Hart. And he, the house was bought and it was gifted to Dalhousie University for the use of its president. Um, so many of our leading families uh, in the 18th and 19th century gained their wealth from the West India trade. So what I'm gonna ask you, and not just uh, right now, Dr. Beckles, is how do we make the university accountable for, for this? What I wanna uh, jump to right now, and I'll get back to this point, is to highlight some of the points that um, you raised just now with respect uh, to what, what must be done. As Lenin said um, so poignantly, uh, 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 just over a hundred years ago, 
what must be done, what can we do? So I'm gonna, you, you mentioned the resistance by scholars, by academic scholars was brushed aside. And then many academic scholars came on board this project. They provided the theological, the philosophical, um, justific sociological justification for African chattel slavery for this crime against humanity. When slavery ended, it was transformed into other models of unfreedom, Jim Crow, apartheid, the oppressiveness of now. Um, academia has become corrupted by the power of slavery. The power of history is all around us, pressing down on our day-to-day -day existence. Universities are now faced with an ethical problem. And if we ignore the unethical conduct of the institution with respect to um, its justification of race, slavery, anti-Blackness, and other uh, racial injustices, um, we, are, we, we, are, we are not in a good place. You state that the pedagogy of the university cannot justify crimes against humanity, and that immorality has taken root in the Western Academy. You said we have not reconstructed the house of Dalhousie and you followed up by um, talking about research and run. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's critically germane to what we're doing here at Dalhousie University, this research and run. Um, we've, we've written the report, Kings has written a report, Dalhousie has written a report. Some of the writers are here on this call. How do we make the university accountable? How do we make, we ensure that the university respond in an ethical way to this current crisis of humanity? I'm quoting from you. You said that we need a new consensus. Universities must now um, show moral leadership. We have to do better. We need a new discourse. We have to reimagine a new future and that's, again, is critically um, important. Reimagine a new future, grasp a great vision is what you're telling us. Academia must, must undo the horrors of the past and push humanity to its highest level of sophistication. So Dr. Beckles, knowing that all you know about our work here at Dalhousie, how do we make the university accountable? and not just the research and run. Um, I, I am hopeful that Dalhousie and Kings will not just do the research and run. The, re the report, the Dal report was published in 2019, Kings a year later. And in both reports, we made a number of recommendations. Dalhousie made 13 and some are have happened, for example, the apology that we asked for, the apology was the first recommendation that happened, but an apology can also be in the same research and run package. I've given my apology then, you know, what, what, why are you people asking for more? Um, so uh, th those are, are some of my points. The main question is, how do we make the university accountable? And a, a follow-up question which you dealt with in the talk actually, because it's something that we all deal with every day is people say, including black people, um, why this reparations? You guys need to just work hard. That's something that happened to your great, great, great grandparents. No, you're free. You look at UFO, you're a professor at university. Why are you talking about reparations? Why are you talking about racial justice? So um, if you could expound on that more, I would be thankful. But the main question is how do we, um, in terms of putting uh, the these you know, this, this, the new Im the imagination forward, how do we concretize or materialize the imagination? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Cooper. And first of all, I want to, I want to, in my humble way, commend you for your tremendous scholarship, your, your advocacy, and, uh, and your integrity as, as a scholar and a citizen. Uh, you are an example of the values 
and the virtues that I would wish to see in every student coming from a university. And I want to thank you for that. Your, your report is an indication of your commitment and your courage. And when I, when I read that report, I was so taken aback uh, by what you were able to so forcefully unearth and then to, to present. The issue is that the house of Dalhousie that began with its first pillar in the Caribbean, and you quite correctly identified that moment uh, when Dalhousie was a participant in the Anglo-French conflict in the Caribbean over the ideology of slavery. And the, the British um, duplicity, on the one hand, speaking about emancipation and ending the slave trade, but at the other hand, taking every opportunity to enlarge their slave holdings. And this was what the Martinique project was all about. You remember also that when the French realized that they could not regain uh, what became Haiti by treaty, they handed it over to the British and the British sent their soldiers uh, into Haiti to recapture it because the 300,000 enslaved Africans in that colony was just too much. They were salivating over the thought that they could add the 300,000 in, in, in saint Domingue, Haiti, and add those to uh, the 100,000 or so they had, 150,000 or so they had in Jamaica. And if they could put them together, that would have been the new complex. And the British went headlong into that. Uh, and Dalhousie was a part of that, part of that strategy. Yes, he arrived in, uh, in, in new, new Scotland. <laughs> Um, which was uh, that if, if England was going to have a new a new England, well, the Scottish should have a new Scotland and uh, and a new Scotland, Nova Scotia, and and that was the project. Scotland attempt to establish itself as one of the most powerful slave trading states. It was that same new Scotland that also led to the deep corruption of Glasgow University. Uh, bringing them into the pit of slavery and using Jamaica as, as the base for Scottish slavery. Uh, and University of Glasgow became the university of choice. The, the, tr the slave owners were sending their children, their sons to Glasgow because that was where the slave, the slave owners were getting good education for their sons to be slave traders and plantation owners and other things. So the house of Dalhousie has spawned a university. And it has spawned a university in its own image, in its own likeness. So Dalhousie University is just that. It's, 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 the, it's the child of the owner that imagined and created it. And that is what it is. And now that we have, we have placed the slave owners and the slave traders, and we have taken down their monuments. And as I said, I was in, I was in Bristol just a month before the people there tore down the monument of Colston, the, the, the leading slave owner, the richest man in the city in his generation, who had built almost through his own enterprise, a town in Barbados where he was based. And many people don't know this, but the second, the second town in Barbados, which is called Spikestown, was called New Bristol. It was New Bristol. And so we had the New Bristol and we had you know, the, the, new, the New Scotland and we had all of these new everything because these um, slave traders and slave owners wanted to expand and take over and rebuild the world. I believe that the academics uh, in all of these communities must constantly be vigilant and to, and to step up their advocacy for justice and fairness. It is so very important. I mean, if you know what these universities have done, if you, if you have any conscience and respect to what they did and the role they play, 
And if you don't have a commitment to undo the legacy that your university has done, if you don't have that commitment to undo that which, which you have done, which has not passed the tests of justice, fairness, and morality. And if in your own time today, you continue to support those structures and legacies, then the only conclusion that can be drawn is that you are endorsing this legacy and you wish to see it sustained. But if a university cannot be ethical, and if the university cannot be excellent unless it's ethical, then we have a serious crisis. We have a very, very serious crisis. I was faced with that predicament when those bones of our ancestors came up from the shallow graves in the heart of our campus. And I was asked as a historian to have management responsibility for this enterprise. The first thing I did was to establish a center for reparations research. It was just not enough to just lecture in Caribbean African history. An advocacy center had to be created to pursue the discourse around reparatory justice and to contribute fundamentally to that. I believe that center for reparations research has changed the university very profoundly, very, very profoundly because not only are the students and the faculty concerned about not engaging in a deep dive into reparatory justice, but also it now shapes the policy and the vision. And interestingly enough, Professor Cooper, we were able to push through a very progressive gender policy about how our female scholars and administrators are not equally represented and fairly in the management of the university, but we were able to arrive at that point of aggression because we had also created a center for reparations research and linking those issues with contemporary injustices. And to use that center for reparations research as an engine to fuel conversations in other parts of civil society and other parts of the university. So we do not look at reparatory justice in isolation. We see it as a critical part of a range of other issues. And so if Lord Dalhousie and building his house and building his university and building a university that has distinguished itself in so many different academic fields, then clearly those academic fields have now to take responsibility for the role that they played historically in sustaining the legacies of these crimes. 1816 is an interesting year, uh, the, 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 the Nova Scotia moment and the Dalhousie entry, but it's also the year in which the enslaved people of Barbados rose up in revolution for the first time. And the irony of that is that when the people of Barbados rose up and fought the British troops and government for freedom, over 120 of them were shipped out to Nova Scotia, were shipped out to Sierra Leone to join those Jamaicans who had also been shipped from Nova Scotia. And Sierra Leone becomes a, a holding place for all of these democratic forces, Nova Scotia, Barbados, Jamaica, and everywhere else where people were struggling for freedom and justice and laying the foundations for the democracy movement that is important and real today, the diversity that is real in today. So I would advise that in answer to your question, what must be done, the advocacy has to be intensified from year to year. It must not allow, be allowed to side, it must intensify around the issue of what is an ethical university. And as for the public, you know, um, yes, we, they, there is certainly a percentage of the descendants of the enslaved community who might not be willing to publicly articulate a preference for reparatory justice. But it has a lot to do with the fact that many of them just don't understand. But, you know, this is one of the issues of leadership. I would ask you this, Professor Cooper, if 
if the enslaved people on the eve of emancipation, if a survey was done, if a survey was done among all the enslaved people everywhere, do you wish to be free tomorrow or you wish to continue as you are? Uh, would it not be interesting to imagine what those opinion polls would show? Um, right now, we are trying to deal with the question of the Republic, getting the Queen of England off our backs as our head of state. Barbados has finally, the place people thought it would least likely to happen, has risen up and said that we want to be completely decolonized. We want to end this royal oppression of our civilization. That seemed to have surprised, surprised people as it surprised them in 1816 that the last place they expected a revolt to take place was in Barbados because it was seen as a colony where British forces were so strong. British forces were so strong, they thought that they had completely oppressed the enslaved people, but yet the place they least expected the revolution to come was right there in Barbados. And today, the, the least they thought Barbados could produce is a Republican philosophy, but it has. So our history is filled with these surprises and it's filled with these moments. So yes, many of our people will say today, well, you know, this reparations issue, we don't, but it is an, un, it's an unstable position. You know, it is an unstable position. They might say that for one reason or another, but when the movement start, as Nelson Mandela said, everything is impossible until it happens. We all thought that apartheid could have gone on for another 50 years. And when those young children in Soweto began to march through the streets, everything changed. Everything changed. And it changed suddenly and rapidly. So, you know, the power of advocacy uh, sometimes is not understood because we don't feel it. But suddenly things begin to move and then everything begins to unravel. So what we are seeing now is the unraveling of modernity and the white supremacy on which it was built. It is being unraveled all over the world. And the pace is gathering because people want to live in peace. You cannot live in peace in a white supremacy culture. And that is the issue. We want to live in universities that are free and fair. We want universities where the culture is about justice and, and conversation and research. If the university is filled with tensions about risk, allocations of resources, access, equity, then that university is not in peace and at peace with itself. We want our universities to be at peace with themselves in and of themselves. So you have a great role to play, Professor Cooper. And please press on because you might, you might feel disillusioned from time to time. You might feel that the fruits of your efforts are not going to be realized, but believe me, you're in for some serious surprises. Thank you, Dr. Beckles. Thank you. I, um, I, I think we're ready uh, now, Russell, for the Q&A. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cooper and uh, Dr. Beckles for that uh, insightful response. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come through, and so we'll start with a few of those. If we uh, just bear with me for a second here. So, uh, Dr. Beckles, can you uh, talk more about the close relationship between uh, repertory justice and resistance to climate change? Well, absolutely. It's um, the Caribbean has found itself in the middle of all of this. You know, we are we are in the hurricane belt. We are in the history belt. You know. Um, the slavery and its legacy and the hurricanes have come behind us. And every year we are exposed to all of this uh, blowing through the history. And um, those who are the descendants of the enslaved mostly living in unsustainable housing, little wooden cabins, because in the slavery period, this is how they lived. They lived in little villages uh, and little wooden shacks and structures uh, because this is what chattel was about. They were chattel property and they were living in chattel houses. 
in the Caribbean, we refer to these houses in which the enslaved live as chattel houses, these little wooden cabins. And I would venture to say that maybe 30% of uh, black people in the Caribbean today are still living in these kinds of structures. And certainly in Barbados, uh, I lived and was born and raised and grew up in a chapel house. And my village in which I born is very much still there with little chapel houses and all through Bridgetown, we have these chapel houses. So yes, when the hurricanes come, who are in the front line of that? When the hurricanes come each year, both the winds and the rain, the primary victims are the descendants of the enslaved people, the working people, the poor people, who just 150 years ago, their parents and themselves were in those houses. Those are the houses to be blown away. Those are the houses to be washed away. Those are the houses to be covered by landslides and mud coming down from the hill and burying those people. Those are the people. So if you cannot see the continuity between the slavery and the hurricanes and the annual deaths in the Caribbean. And now the climate change, the rising sea levels, the rising temperatures of the ocean, destroying the fishery environment. You know, I, I as a child, we, we lived on the flying fish because, you know, we were coastal people and the fishermen brought every day, they brought home the flying fish. And now the rising sea temperatures uh, the fish are finding it difficult to sustain themselves in these increasingly warm waters. And so the fish are migrating and they're moving away. And therefore your, your marine sustainability is threatened. So if you have no land, if you do not own the land, you're not farmers and you're not peasants, uh, you're just laborers and you rely on the marine environment and the temperatures are rising and the fish are migrating, then you are talking about an existential threat a serious existential threat. So you combine climate change and you combine the history and the power associated with poverty and hurricanes. And what you have is a cocktail for destruction. And the Caribbean is at the center of this. And this is why we have been extremely vocal about climate change. And we have been extremely vocal about reparatory justice because for us, the history, the hurricanes, the rising sea temperatures, the rising sea levels are all about the same process of devastation. We call it the triple C, not to mention, of course, the chronic diseases that has ripped through these populations. 60% of all the black people in the Caribbean over the age of 60 have diabetes and hypertension or both. So if you take the marker if you take the marker of chronic diseases, non-communicable chronic diseases, take that criterion, then the black people in the Caribbean are the sickest people in the world because no community in the world has the density of chronic diseases like the Caribbean because the Caribbean was at the center of this horrendous crime. So yes, Nova Scotia is out there in the periphery of it, and in the periphery, sometimes you see all the forces at work, but the center of gravity is where you see all of this. So you put, you put the chronic diseases together as a pandemic. You put the climate change also as a pandemic. Now you have COVID-19 destroying the same poor people who have been fighting these struggles. And what you have is a horrendous legacy. And that legacy originates within the white supremacy structure of slavery. And there's no escape in it. So those who say, finally, we have an argument to, de to decenter the reparations movement. We said, no, the climate change discourse has recentered the reparatory justice movement because they are interlocked and interconnected. And we see this, we see this every day. The, those poor fishermen who cannot find their fish those villagers who cannot find their fish, these are the same descendants of the people whose houses are washed away by mudslides and, and blown away by the winds of hurricanes on an annual basis. This is all part of the same conversation about how a people, having gone through the, the darkest hour of history, 
continues to feel the effects of that darkness every single day. It is all very integrated, and we must recognize that. Thank you. Uh, folks, just a reminder that if you have a question, I see uh, in the uh, participant uh, area that there's a, a person with their hand up. If you have a question or a comment, you can put it in the Q&A uh, section of Zoom. The next question we have is speaking about the pillars of uh, repertory justice. What are the top priorities uh, that, that you would uh, identify in, in your opinion? Well, where we are now, uh, I think in the movement, my opinion as to where we are now is to bring the African governments on board. It has been a diaspora movement thus far. It has been led for maybe 200 years by diaspora Africans. You know, when all the European governments and so on were pushing through their emancipation legislation, the to be emancipated were saying, how about us? We want reparations. So we can see the antecedents of the reparations movement in the slavery period. In the case of the Caribbean, they were saying to the British government, you got 200 years of free labor from us. We want to talk about justice. 200 years of, la of free labor from 20 million people. Now, can you imagine, can you do the calculation? 200 years of free labor from 20 million people and put a value on that and think of the significance of that extraction which you then bring home to fuel your own economic and social development. And that is something you wish to walk away from. It's not going to happen. So I would say that the movement of reparations in which I'm involved in at the moment, from my study of the history of it, this is the eighth iteration. I'm involved in the eighth wave of it. Yes, it rises and falls. And this is the eighth moment. And we have looked at each moment in the last 200 years when our ancestors were raised in this conversation. But I believe that we need to bring the African states <clears throat> on board and that has already started to happen we had for the first time in history two months ago the very first caribbean african summit of presidents the presidents and prime ministers of the caribbean and the presidents and prime ministers of africa met in the summit for the very first time that was historic that was huge and what do they agree on? Economic relationships, political diplomacy, building a bond between the African political process and the diaspora political processes. But they also all agree to begin to work on reparations as a transatlantic movement. So we have placed before the African leaders that they should host, consider hosting a global reparation move, uh, conference or summit in Africa in 2022. We are hopeful <laughs> that one of those African countries or a group of them would put up their hand and say, we will host the global reparations summit where all of the reparation leaders and groups and organizations, grassroots, academics, NGOs can all gather. I think you're looking at probably 20,000 people turning up for a summit. But that is what we are trying to prepare for next year. And I think that will be a game changer. I think it will, it will be another moment in which the world will change and, and another moment in which uh, Professor Cooper can see that things are galloping at a pace. We are quite confident in the Caribbean that Africa will host this global summit. And uh, then the academics can go to work because you know, one of the things we have to destroy, one of those mythologies is that somehow Africa cannot come on board this reparations train because 
there were participants in the slave trade. Well, that's the kind of myth that we have to destroy because many of our own people believe it. And we have said time and time again, this is European propaganda. This is slave traders propaganda. They arrive in Africa, the most militarized force the Africans had ever seen. Slave trading companies were some of the biggest corporations in the world, had massive armies, and it, it changed the balance of power in West Africa. Any country that stood in the way of the slave trade was destroyed. Any king or or tribal leader who resisted was destroyed. And we have the information showing that when African kings were standing up and resisting the slave trade companies, the slave trade companies wrote back to London asking for military firepower. And the instruction is coming out of London that this king must be destroyed because he's standing in the way of business. So I can tell you, we have that information is there to show the age of terrorism that was unleashed upon the political leadership of Africa. And I would say to you this, uh, uh, Russell, the final point on this question, the comparisons between the slave trade and the narcotics trade today are very striking. If you look at the leading export to West Africa in the 17th and 18th centuries, the leading commodity export from Europe to Africa were guns. Guns were the leading commodity sold in West Africa by the merchants of Western Europe because the slave trade also led to the militarization of West Africa. And the slave traders were the most powerful military force on the continent. So alongside the trade in in enslaved Africans with the, was the militarization and the trading in guns because guns and slaves went together in exactly the same way that guns and drugs go together today. The relationships are very striking indeed. And I can tell you, in much the same way that many small countries are easily run over by drug trading cartels, many of those small African nations were run over by the slave trading corporations in exactly the same way. And yes, you always have the occasional collaborator. And I can tell you, you cannot have a major international crime without a few local collaborators. But the presence of those local collaborators does not make the crime less heinous. It makes it even more heinous because a few people are called upon for profit to participate in the destruction of their communities that are in resistance. And in much the same way that the majority of African communities were in resistance fighting and migrating and moving and turning their face on the slave trade. Yes, there were always a few of them who were undermining their community efforts. And we see this in the narcotics trade. We see it where individuals undermine entire communities. And these comparisons are very important. Yet, however, no one in their right mind would say, that all of the narcotics that enter through an American port and go to poison our children. No one would say the country is a drug trading country. You would say we have some participants, they're going to track them down, we're going to lock them up, put them in jail. But we don't say the nation is a drug trading nation. And this is what European scholars have done. European scholars have argued that because there were a few African participants in the slave trade, that the African people, the African nation, the African states were slave traders. And that is the myth that they have established. And it was a racist piece of historical mythology. Now we have to uproot that and get rid of it so that we can see what actually happened. 
where on the ground, villages, towns, communities, people were fighting every day against slave traders. And even when there were moments when a king or a chief to protect his own people would say, well, listen, don't take my people, but I will allow you to pass through my boundaries, my borders. All kinds of deals were being made because it was a volatile political environment. But what we do know that resistance was the primary characteristic and feature of West Africa. And that is a history that is now ready to be told. The evidence is emerging from time to time. And that is going to be the basis, I believe, on which many African governments will now say, you know, we were put on the ideological offensive by white racist scholarship, but now we have debunked it. And now we can be far more assertive in, in presenting our case for reparations as well and uniting the continent and the diaspora on the front for reparatory justice. But we the scholars, we have a lot of work to do. So that leads to the next question. Uh, do reparations involve a fundamental transformation of the uh, international economic and political system? The, the model of reparatory justice that we in the Caribbean uh, advocating for is what you might call an economic model. I know that the uh, reparations is a big tent. And in the case of the US and Canada, for example, where families were targeted by racist forces and their land was taken away, their, their businesses were destroyed, their family members were murdered in the streets, where these things actually happened, we believe that there has to be investigation and reparations paid in the form of financial atonement. We believe in that fundamentally. But at the same time, we are also saying that we want a developmental model. The Europeans extracted 200 years of free labor from 20 million people and have left this region in dire straits and poverty. The Europeans walked away from this region and left behind this horrendous legacy and mess of poverty, illiteracy, bad housing, bad public health. It is almost criminal to imagine what they walked away and left behind. And they said, okay, you want, you want independence? You want democracy where well, you can have it, but you have it on our terms. We're out of here. You fend for yourselves. You clean up your own mess. You're poor, not because of how we have left your condition. You're poor because you don't have a culture of economic development. The issues are now very clear. What has independence done in the Caribbean? If you consider Jamaica, for example, one of our largest communities, the British took Jamaica in 1655 from the Spanish and ruled it until 1962, 300 plus years. Extracted all of that wealth, Jamaica became its largest wealth extracting colony. They walked away and they left 70% of the people in Jamaica, the black people in Jamaica, were left functionally illiterate. Inadequate infrastructure, hardly any hospitals to speak about. They left a mess and told the Jamaican people, okay, you want independence, we'll have it, now go and develop. Go and develop. Well, first of all, the Jamaican people have done magnificently in converting that horrendous colonial situation that Britain dumped on them. They have converted that into a stable nation state. You cannot underestimate the achievement of that colonial mess being converted into a nation state. Not yet perfect, but a tremendous transformation. And you have to big up the Jamaican people for having the courage and the confidence to take on the project of nation building. But can you imagine if the British had given them a developmental a developmental package. If Britain had given them a Marshall Plan, put back just 10% of the money they took from Jamaica, put it back into roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, 
education, if they had invested even 10% of the money they took out of Jamaica by plunder and put back 10%, how far Jamaica would have been ahead in its economic development and transformation. We are saying that Britain has to come back to the site of their crime and reinvest some of that money they extracted from 200 years of free labor so that we can begin to get support for economic and social development. And we're not going to allow them to walk away from this mess and say, well, you're on your own. No, reparations for us is a developmental paradigm that speaks about cleaning up the mess by repairing the mess that you have created. We're not asking them to come back and manage our countries. No, we're not saying that. We're saying come back and participate and partner with the people who are trying every day to achieve development. If I consider, for example, this, take this one simple statistic. We are in the hemisphere. I'm the chairman of Universities Caribbean, which is an association of 53 universities. If you take the age cohort, 18 to 30, which is the youth cohort, the Caribbean, the English speaking Caribbean has the lowest enrollment in higher education in the entire hemisphere. From Alaska to Argentina, the English speaking Caribbean has the lowest enrollment in higher education because of this legacy of colonization. And you're said, you're said, go and develop when you don't have the capacity because you are, you are moving from colony to nation and you get no development support for that transformation, you're left to carry that on your own and you are left to fund your development with debt. So each time you build a school, a hospital, a, a, a campus, you're building bridges, you're, whatever you're trying to do to create the infrastructure for development, you have to indebt yourself to get it done. And so poverty, indebtedness, poverty, indebtedness, driven by the desire for development. And that is the legacy of slavery and colonization. And this is why we support reparations to break that cycle so that we can have sustainable development. So what role does the UN play or have to have to play in, in the process of reparations? In 1961, 62, the UN took a, a global policy position that colonization has no future in the 20th century. And the United Nations through the Anti-Colonial Commission or the Commission for Decolonization laid out in an infrastructure that colonization of people must end. But the Caribbean today remains colonized. The British have colonies in the Caribbean, the Virgin Islands, Montserrat, the Cayman Islands, the Turks and Caicos Islands are British colonies. The French have Martinique and Guadeloupe, French, colonies. The Dutch have Curacao, Aruba, Bonaire, Dutch colonies. The Caribbean is the only part of the world today that is still colonized by foreign powers. The Caribbean is the only part of the world that still has colonies as part of its everyday life. So the United Nations has taken some very important positions about colonization, about the legacies of slavery and the need for reparatory justice and human rights and civil rights, they have laid the foundation for it. But as you know, the United Nations do not have the capacity to enforce its own policy frameworks. And so yes, they have performed well, they have done what they had to do. And thank God we have something called the United Nations to protect us from the excesses of some powerful nations. But yet, the Caribbean is proof that their own policy framework has failed because we are still, by and large, in our region. The first colonies that were built after Columbus came 
Columbus came and the colonization began. And we are still here in that colonial position today. So there we have it. We still have colonization and the consequences of that. Does Cuba's uh, special relationship with Africa and Haiti provide us with a glimpse into the framework that would give a, a new relationship with Africa and the African diaspora? Well, you know, if, if, you, if you take a deep dive into uh, what the Cubans have done by sending out value systems into the world, Africa might still have been under the grip of apartheid if the Cubans had not intervened. Other nations were speaking about justice and other forms of literary interventions. The Cuban people, mostly black people, constituted as an army, went into Mozambique, went into Angola, and ended apartheid and military colonization in the southern part of that colony. The Cuban forces were the critical forces that shift the balance of power against the colonialists and gave the local people a chance to have the freedom that they enjoy today. Nelson Mandela might still very well have spent another decade on Robbins Island. Angola, Mozambique, Namibia might still have been European colonies. And we will still be talking today about apartheid. Cannot underestimate the power of that. And which is why when Nelson Mandela came out of jail, the first nation he visited. Despite protestation from the Europeans and from the Americans saying, you cannot do that, you cannot do this, Mr. Mandela. Nelson got on the plane and went to Cuba to thank the Cuban people for what they did. Great speech, he said. You have, you can have many friends in the world who would write speeches in support of you. But if a friend comes and takes you by the hand and takes you out of the pit, that's a special friend. That's very powerful. And on that note, our, our time is winding down. And I'd like to give the last word to you before I uh, close things off this evening. And I ask this question uh, in the journey that you've had in working on this subject matter. What do you feel are the major challenges that we face today as we move it forward? Well, you know, Russell, I, I was raised up as the grandchild of an evangelical preacher. Okay, so I came through, I came through the progressive church. Uh, I was raised up in that environment and I believe that people, humans, are fundamentally good. I believe that humans have a, a special gift of showing camaraderie, friendship, and decency. I believe that many of us are driven off target by minorities who do not share these views. And so I proceed on the basis that good will always triumph. And so, I am always surprised and disappointed, even though I'm a historian, when I see forces at work, individual institutional forces that protect not only ill-gotten gain, but also protect privileges that they know to be antisocial and to be inhumane. So yes, Russell, I'm always surprised, but not surprised in an intellectual sense, more disappointed. So yes, I, um, I operate on a certain um, ideological terrain uh, that promotes justice and freedom. But I know that while the majority of humanity might think along those lines, there are 
powerful forces at work that are preventing us from achieving the kind of humanity relationship that we're trying to achieve. And that has been a part of human history uh, for quite a while. So all of us who are really idealists, uh, I do hope that we can make it, we can make it better uh, for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So, so that, that is it. It's, it's as, it is sometimes painful, it's sometimes frustrating, but you know, if you understand the forces of history and you know something about uh, how minorities do rule majorities, then you remain confident that you can push on through. So Russell, it's, it's, it's love and friendship, my brother. Amen to that. Thank you very much. On behalf of all of us on the planning committee, we are so thankful for your time for your insight and this powerful discussion. We look forward to uh, continued uh, conversations as uh, Dalhousie and uh, University of King's College and the Black Cultural Center work towards um, the in-person, as we hope, a conference in 2023. And hopefully we'll see you on the, uh, the shores of Nova Scotia um, and uh, that we can, we can see in person. As a token of our appreciation, um, the University of uh, Dalhousie University, University of King's College, and the Black Cultural Center will purchase copies of your books to put in our libraries uh, so that people can uh, consume uh, some of the wealth of knowledge and information that you've, you've uh, produced. And on behalf of everyone, I'd like to once again thank you so much and thank all those that participated uh, today in um, the series of panels that we've had on this important discussion on um, you know, uh, slavery and reparations. And I hope that this is just the tip of the iceberg of a new way of thinking, a new format of discussion, and most importantly, moving us towards a better realization of uh, and recognition of, of the struggles of the past and how they have uh, impacted us today. Have a great night, everyone, and uh, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.